I guess you can uh, if you want. Yeah. So, hello everybody. I'm doing the presentation today. It's my honor <laughs> to introduce to you uh, Dr. Professor William uh, So, uh, I think he's, oh, yeah, I think, I think he's the best birder I know. He's like crazy, you can go where the floor, and he knows every bird and the song and like different mm -hmm. variations of different types of the species. So, but I know he's actually a, a data reviewer and an editor of eBird. So, and he's had like extensive experience in Sweden and Senegal and uh, in Peru, you know, Berlin. And yeah, so he did his PhD in Uppsala University on avian malaria and in the specific interactions in the flycatcher. And on August uh, 2020, uh, he joined the lab as a doctoral researcher and he mainly focused on three Madagascar plovers and yeah so he explored the environmental and ecological factors that affect demographic trends in these species but also he worked with um, bottom quails and did some research also in malaria so yeah enjoy your show <laughs> thanks Oscar so yes uh, thanks everybody um, so yes, I, I, I came up with this sort of very, very broad title, The Life History of Shorebirds, uh, and to sort of talk about what I've been doing in the last two years in Debreson. And then I realized it was getting a bit long for an hour talk, so I, I just kind of cut it down a bit. So yes, I'm just going to really focus on Madagascar and, and how uh, potentially climatic uh, uh, variation there is driving interesting demographic and life history patterns in uh, the plovers in Madagascar, and also some bottom quail stuff, because there was some time for that. So yes, as Oscar said, I arrived here. I gave a talk here just as I arrived in August 2020, and I've been stalking the corridors of here and the Tomkey ever since, uh, when I've not been in the field. But yes, let's go straight into it. So first of all, what are shorebirds, and why are they very inter a very interesting system? to study from uh, ecological and evolutionary perspectives. Well, shorebirds, they're hugely diverse in their morphology, their behavior, their habitat requirements. And this has either led to the development of, or it has sort of uh, fac yeah, facilitated uh, very divergent life history traits across the group, across these about 250 different species. And this really allows us to investigate how life history traits have evolved, how mating strategies have evolved, and you can see here from several examples of different shorebirds that you can find around the world. We have species like the oyster catchers, which are sort of uh, very monomorphic between the sexes. Uh, uh, they have, uh, yeah, they're monogamous, they have biparental care. And we have species like the ruff down here, which uh, they have uh, this lecking behavior. We have very highly ornamented males, which very high competition for mates. And then we have sort of the opposite and this really interesting system such as the painted snipe down in the bottom right there where it's reversed and sexual reversal. And so you can see this is a mating pair, but this is the male, smaller, more cryptic, and the female is larger and the female does all the competition for the mates and the male does all the uh, incubation and parental care behaviors. And morphologically, shorebirds can be really strange. They don't all look like plovers and sandpipers. We have these really weird button quail which don't look like they should belong in shorebirds, but they, they are, and I'll talk about those at the end. And you have other birds like the sheathbill, which, again, doesn't really behave like what we'd expect a shorebird to, but, uh, but they are. And so this all leads to this huge diversity. And so I'm talking about this, this life history traits, life history strategies. What does this mean if you don't know? Well, essentially, it, it boils down to the for very basic things about how animals and well, how organisms live. So how long does an organism live? At what age does that organism start to reproduce? Uh, how many offspring does that organism have? Does it have, uh, how many offspring does it have at each different reproductive event and across its lifespan? How do they move? Where do they go? Um, and how do they share investment in reproduction between the sexes? And so from that, we're gonna dive straight into Madagascar. Madagascar is an incredibly diverse island uh, lots of different habitat types from lush tropical rainforests, wetlands, uh, deserts and semi-deserts. 
It's also under a lot of pressure, a lot of human pressure, uh, especially in, in the centre of the country. Most of the forests that would have been there have now gone, replaced by rice paddies or just grasslands. But it's a very diverse place, and, and one of the reasons it's very diverse is it's been separated uh, from, from Africa, been separated from India for many millions of years. Uh, the organisms there have uh, uh, diverged from their mainland counterparts, and so it's very high endemism, and very, very different organisms live there. Uh, another driver of this incredible diversity there uh, is how climatically variable it is. So you have in these, these, uh, these two maps here, in A, this is uh, mean annual temperature. So you can see in the central highlands, it can get really quite cold. Um, but uh, on, the, on the coasts, especially on, on the west, it can get really very warm. And in plot B, we see rainfall here. So we see very high rainfall along the east coast of the country. And in the, this eastern mountain range, this is where all the, pretty much all the tropical rainforests are, the lush forests. But when you get down into the south and the southwest here, this is where we get very, very dry, very little rainfall and, and desert-like uh, conditions. Um, Madagascar has been subject to frequent uh, cycles, uh, climatic cycles. These are the cycles which have been going on for millennia. Um, but we're finding that these droughts, they're becoming, they're becoming more frequent, they're becoming more intense, and they're generally lasting longer. And so this has had uh, very recently a sort of very stark humanitarian problem, especially in the southwest of the country. Um, and this is just expected to get worse and worse in the coming decades with, with climate change. So not only is this a humanitarian issue, uh, as an ecologist, we're also interested to see, well, how do organisms deal with this? Several of these species have have adapted along this for, for, for millennia, but how will organisms cope with this going forward? So this is one of the things which I've been thinking about during my time in Debrecen. So there have been several studies in, in Madagascar and other parts of the world to find out how organisms deal uh, with drought and these sort of stochastic and variable conditions. So some species, when they, the, the year turns out to be a drought year, there's not a lot rain, they can't really look after their offspring, so they just don't bother breeding. Uh, this bird in the top left, this is the Razo lark from Cape Verde. And in years when there isn't any rainfall, they just don't bother to breed. Because why go to the bother of building a nest, tr laying your eggs, trying to raise chicks, that's a complete waste of your resources if those chicks are just going to die. Um, other organisms do it a bit more subtly, so... Oh, whoops. Uh, so like the uh, Varose Shifaka, this is a lima, which is found in southwest Madagascar. In the drought years, they also reduce their investment. Uh, so they may just have one, um, uh, one baby instead of several. And uh, other species can be very plastic in their breeding times. So this is the groove-billed annie from uh, South and Central America. Um, when rainfall, rainfall might come early, it might come late, it might not come at all. And so uh, these birds are very, very good at uh, adjusting their breeding cycle to really time it for those rains, uh, which isn't a trivial thing because a lot of species, especially in the, uh, in the temperate zones and the Arctic, they have a very set phenology. Um, and so uh, a lot of these organisms in, in these uh, more stochastic places are very good at adjusting very quickly to rapidly changing conditions. So where do we study these, uh, some of these things? So here's the map of Madagascar, and we have our field site down here. This is Andavadok, and uh, Tamas, and uh, Sama Zafania, who's our collaborator in Madagascar. I've been studying the plovers there since 2009, 2008 sort of time, and continuously since then. And the site is an interesting mosaic of uh, salt marshes, beaches, mangroves, and, and islands. And so these gray areas, you can see the salt marshes. Um, and these are all some very large ones. Uh, this is about uh, six kilometers from uh, north to south. Uh, and then smaller ones, which are uh, uh, isolated in patches of spiny forest and, uh, and, and scrubland. 
And this is kind of what it looks like on the ground. So it's the worst places in the world to do field work. But you can see, yes, yeah, so the sandy beaches, uh, mangrove forests, some semi-permanent uh, uh, semi water bodies, very few of those. But most of them, this is the, this very large site, these salt pans. And here we can see the water in there. You can see piles of salt as well. Uh, there's a bit of local extraction of salt from local communities. Um, but interesting, these salt pans, um, they only get their water from rainfall. There are no rivers or inflows, um, not even from the sea. So any water that appears only has, can only come from rainfall. Um, and this is also, uh, the substrate for this is, is limestone. So any water that falls here, not only is it going to evaporate pretty quickly, but it also drain away very quickly. And so this is very ephemeral uh, habitat. So when the, when the water appears, the birds require that water to breed, really need to get on and breed as soon as that water's there because they can't hang around because it will go. Uh, this was back in June. We had a very unseasonable fall of rain and this lasted for about a month and then it was gone. Uh, this is a very messy graph, sorry about that. Uh, this is just showing what rainfall is like, so you can just see just every year, it's just completely random almost. But you do see some sort of trends, so you can see that generally you get more rainfall in January and February, and uh, less rainfall in sort of July, August, September. But you can also see there's a lot of variation between years, so it really is a very variable place. And so the birds that we study. So three species of plover. The first one is the Madagascar plover. Uh, this is an endemic species to Madagascar. It's globally threatened, it's classed as vulnerable, and it is declining. Uh, it seems to be a pretty strong habitat specialist to these ephemeral salt marshes. Uh, they lay two eggs uh, in their nest, and they are monogamous, and they have um, uh, uh, biparental care. So both, both parents look after the uh, the eggs and the, and the hatchlings. The second species is the white-fronted plover. Uh, this is found across sub-Saharan Africa. It's a bit, uh, has a bit broader habitat requirements, so you'll also find it breeding on the beaches, uh, sandbanks, and in the salt marshes. In Madagascar, there's an endemic subspecies which looks a bit different to the one on the mainland. They can lay up to three eggs, slightly larger clutches. They're also monogamous. Um, but you do see that there is a tendency towards uniparental care sometimes. So uh, after the eggs have hatched, uh, uh, often you'll find one adult tends to desert the nest after the, after the chicks have hatched. And it's often the female which deserts, not the male. The third species is the Kitlitz's plover. I sort of call this a super tramp species. It's found in any sort of open habitat across Africa, uh, anywhere where there might be a bit of water in open habitat. Uh, they can have smaller clutches, uh, often you only find one egg in their, in their nests, but one or two usually. And they have a, a, a very different system, so we, it's more of a mixed system. So they can be monogamous, uh, they can be um, polyandrous, so one female will mate with six, sequentially mate with several males and move on. And often they have uniparental care, especially after the chicks have hatched, then it's one adult left to look after the chicks. So as I say, we've been monitoring these populations uh, for several years now, and this has involved catching and ringing of birds. This is uh, Dr. Sama Safani, our local collaborator, who is the plover guru. He, anything that he doesn't know about these plovers is not worth knowing. Um, but yes, so we, we catch the birds, we ring them, we put unique color bands on them so we can follow them in the field throughout their lifespans. Um, we monitor the nests, the growth rate of the chicks, there's yeah, some ringing here. So it's just very standard protocols. So the first question, well, how do these plovers deal with drought and, and changes in the climate? So do they adjust their timing of breeding? Are they able to do that with the rains change? Uh, how do they adjust their reproductive investment? Do they change their clutch sizes or do they uh, adjust their egg sizes? And then sort of population and also individual level breeding intensity change depending on the conditions. So we have breeding data yeah, from 2008 to 2020 um, at Andavadok. 
uh, which was almost 3,000 nests across the three different species, so quite a bit of data, and almost 8,000 eggs in total that were measured. And also we had the rainfall data from uh, uh, the National uh, Climatology Offices in uh, Madagascar. So what did we find? Well, we found that breeding intensity varied widely between years. And we, we also found that in some years there was no breeding at all. So here we just see maps of the sites for the three different species, uh, Kitlitz, Madagascar, white-fronted. And then you just see sort of breeding intensity, so there's nests mapped on the site. And you can see each year there's huge variations. 2018, there was virtually nothing. Uh, 2011 was a terrible year, 2012 wasn't great, 2013 was a fantastic. So lots and lots of variation. And what we found is that the number of nests increased um, when there was a higher annual rainfall. And we saw that especially for the Kitlis's plover in blue here, this was particularly stark. All three species was a significant increase, but Kitlitz's really was huge increase in breeding uh, attempts in those wettest years. Um, when it came to uh, investment into the clutch and egg sizes and clutch sizes, uh, we found that with clutch size, Madagascar and Kitlitz plovers it didn't change their clutch sizes depending on the conditions. But we did find that white, front, white fronted plovers were more likely to lay an extra egg uh, in, those, in those higher quality, those wetter years. Interestingly, though, when, you looked at the to when we looked at total clutch volume, so the volume of, of all the eggs in the nest, uh, we didn't see any significant difference. So even though those white fronted plovers, they are laying an extra egg, uh, those eggs generally are smaller. So it's quite interesting. It's a bit of a trade-off there, potentially, between uh, clutch size and, and, and egg size. We'd imagine that larger eggs might be better, uh, better at dealing with uh, uh, drier conditions. They might be more viable, potentially. When we look on the individual level, so this is the uh, individual variation in nest initiation dates. So when we looked at uh, uh, some of these birds that we knew their identity and we looked to see, okay, when did that bird start breeding over several years? And we have the three different species here and we have uh, females and males. And we found some interesting differences here. So Madagascar plovers uh, in the middle here, uh, very, very variable in their nest initiation times. So it could breed very late one year or very early the next year. Um, there was a big tail on the, on the Kitlitz's data, but generally they were slightly less bearable. And the white-fronted plovers were very inflexible in their nesting times. So uh, if they really sort of, if, they, if the conditions were right in, in the week that they wanted to breed, they would breed. And if they weren't right, they wouldn't breed. So it's was interesting different strategies going on here with the three species. So let's kind of just boil that down into a table a bit. So each species takes a different suite of approaches. So Kitlitz's plovers, when the breeding, if the conditions are good, they really go for it. Loads and loads of nests. Madagascar plovers and white-fronted plovers, they did increase a bit, but not to the same extent. Timing of breeding, though, Madagascar plovers are very good at changing their timing of breeding. And the white-fronted plovers, no change at all. Kitlitz is somewhere in between. Kitlitz and Madagascar did not change their clutch sizes or their sort of total clutch volumes. But we did see that the white-fronted plovers were laying... Uh, uh, Fewer eggs in the drought years, but those eggs were larger. So this is kind of interesting from the breeding perspective. Um, but one, the other thing I wanted to look at was a bit of survival and adult survival going on here. So this is another very key component in life histories. <clears throat> so adult survival in birds, well, there's some interesting patterns that you find um, if you look at this on a comparative scale. It's, this is, it's been shown, particularly in passerines, uh, that you tend to have higher survival in the tropics than you would do in, um, in, in higher latitudes. And one of the, the hypotheses about this is that there's uh, more predation going on in the tropics, so uh, lower nest survival. And so this would then uh, select for longer lifespans because to maintain your fitness, if you're going to lose your nests every year, if you're going to maintain your fitness, you need to live longer so you can compensate for that. That's, that's one of the main theories. There's also been some theories that, uh, that you generally find higher survival on islands. Uh, and this is 
Thought to be because uh, there's lower predation uh, pressure on islands, fewer predators around generally. Um, I'm also just going to mention here that when we talk about, so when I'm talking about survival here, I'm talking about apparent survival. There's a difference between true survival and apparent survival. Um, the methods, most methods when they look at survival, you're really looking at apparent survival in the wild because you don't know whether that bird has died necessarily or just flown away and gone somewhere else where you can't detect it. Um, and there, there are ways of disentangling this. I won't go into them, but this, when I talk about survival, I'm almost always talking about apparent survival here. So again, had some hypotheses about this. So uh, I, I thought that all three species were going to have a very high adult survival because they do miss out on breeding opportunities when the conditions aren't great. So they're going to need to compensate for that. They're also in the tropics and they're on an island. So this would all sort of uh, uh, contribute towards that. I also thought that maybe the Madagascar plovers might have lower apparent survival than uh, the other two species. After all, it's a threatened declining species. Maybe adult survival is one of the drivers of this. I also thought we might find some uh, sex specific, interesting sex specific differences, especially in the Kitlitzes plovers, just because they have that different mating system, more uniparental care, uh, some uh, polyandry. So again, from the same period of time, so uh, monitored, uh, yeah, just over 1,800 individuals from the three species. Again, Kitlitzes plover, the more common one, but still good sample sizes for the other two species. And that was about 4,500 detection events. So what we did, so as I mentioned earlier, every bird had a unique set of color, colorings. So we could go into the field. Even if we couldn't catch the bird, we could see it and say, okay, you're alive this year, you're alive this year. If we didn't see you this year, oh, you're alive this year, and, and things like that. So then we can then ac calculate this apparent survival using program mark. I'm not gonna go into the methods. If you're interested in the methods, I'm very happy to talk about them afterwards. And so we'll just dive straight into the results here. So we found incredibly high apparent survival rates for all three species. Uh, so we have Kitlitzes, Madagascar, white-fronted plovers. But we found no differences in sex-specific survival for any of the species. So uh, females in red, males in blue. There's something a bit strange going on with the Kitlitzes plovers here, which I'll just explain. Um, so the model which came out with the best support for this showed lower apparent survival in that year after marking. Uh, we didn't see this for the other two species at all. This is quite interesting and this really uh, drives home that this is really apparent survival and not true survival. And this is probably an uh, artifact of the fact that maybe the Kitlitzes plovers are moving around the island a lot more. Um, and so we catch them in one year, they don't, haven't necessarily died, they've just moved on to the next site, whilst we will have some local birds which stick around for a long time as well, which we see here. So this is probably another strategy that these Kitlitzes plovers have, which the others don't have, so they don't really have site fidelity, but they will move around looking for those conditions. So, um, yeah, I mean, this doesn't really mean much, unless you're really familiar with these methods, oh, we're sort of about not point nine apparent survival. That's very hard to sort of know what that means if you're not very familiar with this. So we can convert these to lifespans. And so this is what we get. We get that they're sort of between nine and a half, sort of 12 and a half years. So this is the life expectancy of these birds. This isn't maximum lifespan. So these birds are living really, really long. These are not big birds at all. These are, these are small. The kitless plover is the smallest plover species. Uh, so this is very, very high, and we have several birds which are likely going to live longer. We have several birds which we've had seen every single year since we've started, and we're still seeing them. So um, uh, maximum lifespan could be considerably longer for several of these species. So yeah, they're very, very long-lived. And so when we compare this to uh, estimates from other uh, plover species around the world, so we have the three Madagascar populations here, we can see, so yeah, 0 0.85, 0 0.9, 0 0.92. When we look at these sort of uh, temperate Arctic species, we see um, much lower uh, uh, annual survival, apparent survival rates. The only populations which really come close are the South African populations of white-fronted plover, which I guess we'd expect something similar there. And also some of the New Zealand species, um, again, island species, 
especially uh, this on the New Zealand Dotterill, very high survival there. These breed on very little uh, islets off New Zealand, incredibly intensive conservation management, predator removal. Um, we have no management whatsoever for these Madagascar species. Um, so I would imagine if we, if we put these in similar management conditions, we'd see even higher survival. So yeah, why should survival be so high? As I said, well, the tropical habitat, yes. Um, potentially high nest predation rates. I'm not sure that's actually true, and I'll come to that very briefly in a second. Um, island living, I, I struggle with this theory, especially in the context of Madagascar. Madagascar is vast. If you, put, if you superimpose Madagascar onto Europe, it would stretch from Malaga to Paris. It's huge, and it has a very um, diverse set of predators. Uh, native and introduced. So I really do think that it is these environmental drivers which is driving these long, uh, long lifespans in these birds. Yeah, we didn't see any sex differences uh, in survival. Uh, again, I think this might be a sign of equal parental investment um, in the monogamous species. Uh, I think it's also true really for the kitlessus plover because you do find that males and females will care for the offspring. They'll just do it in a uniparental setting. So it, it's still equal investment if you really think about it. So what sort of conclusions can we dry, uh, derive from the plover work? Well, we find that all three species, they've evolved different methods for coping with uh, drought and climate stochasticity. Um, and each species takes a, a different overall approach. I, I thought this was really interesting. I mean, they're, they're fairly closely related species. They're breeding in almost exactly the same place, but they really have chosen different strategies. And yes, adult survival is particularly high in response to a reduction in breeding opportunities across their lifespan. But what will the future hold for these birds? Uh, we don't really know. If we really think about the Madagascar plover, they do have a sort of more sensitive phenology. They do seem to be a bit better at, at dealing with, uh, on the individual level, dealing with, uh, with changes in conditions year on year. But they are inflexible in other, other measured traits as well, such as their sort of breeding, uh, the, the investment into their eggs and their clutches. And we found that adult survival is not driving the population trends here, so we really need to think about this and look, look what might be driving population declines. I mean, they might be better suited to the more permanent salt marsh habitats. Maybe the place where we study them is, is just a very good site for them, and they're doing very well there, but in other areas in the island, they're not doing so well. Uh, we know that they have low dispersal rates, and so this might make them very vulnerable to habitat fragmentation. Um, and so we really need to think about these other uh, life stages and really do, once we have these estimates, we can figure out some population viability analyses. We can find out, okay, where, uh, where the pinch points in this population are. Uh, I mentioned briefly the, the nest survival. This is something we're, we're about to submit. Um, well, we just looked at the, yeah. So this is nest survival, and we found no real differences between the species. The only differences we found were uh, that uh, larger clutches had higher survival. Um, but I think uh, Madagascar plovers, this central bar. So one egg clutch is two egg clutch, three egg clutch, obviously only for the white fronted plover. Um, but there's no real difference between the species there. We didn't see any temporal trends. Um, um, but this sort of trend for larger clutches, maybe it's just because more investment requires more investment in your time to protect those nests. I don't know. We're still thinking about it a little bit. As I said, at the start, Madagascar is, is changing. It is becoming drier. Uh, and there has been a decline in biodiversity in the last thousand years. So this is some of the vertebrate species you can find in wetlands in Madagascar today. So we have the three plover species we study. There's a, another plover, the three-banded plover. There's a jacana, there's a, a pratincol, there's Nile crocodile. If you went a thousand years ago to some of these wetlands, you would find at least three different hippopotamus species, several extra crocodilians. Uh, there was a lapwing, which probably only went extinct 500 years ago. It was a grebe. Now, some of these species have gone extinct because of direct human uh, uh, influences. Some of the hippo species is evidence that, uh, that, uh, that it was humans which drove them directly to extinction. 
But a lot of it is because the islands become drier. A lot of the wetlands that used to, used to be vast wetlands along western Madagascar, which have almost completely disappeared just because it's a drier place. And it might be that some of these species, there's not much we can do about it. It's, it's, we might find that the Madagascar plover is just destined to, as it becomes uh, drier, just to move into this column. Okay, so that's the plover stuff. So one thing uh, sort of discovered when working with the plovers um, was that around the field site, there was a lot of another shorebird species, uh, button quail. Um, button quail are really, really weird. And this I think is gonna be a bit of a future direction for me, hopefully. Um, very peculiar birds. So I'll just go into them a little bit. So button quail have been a bit of a puzzle for a long, long time. As I mentioned before, I, I mean, if you look at this, this you, the first thing you'd think, you don't really think this is going to be related to plovers or uh, sandpipers or oyster catchers and birds like that. So taxonomists have had a real problem with the, these birds for the past 150 years. They've been moved around bird orders like nothing else. So they thought they were in the galliforms, so they thought they were chickens, and then they thought they were pigeons or maybe sand grouse. Then people thought, okay, maybe they're rails of some weird type of rail for a long time. And it wasn't really until modern phylogenetics uh, emerged they discovered that, to everyone's surprise, um, that they were actually firmly embedded in Charadriformes, which is the main order which includes shorebirds, but also gulls and terns and orcs and things like that. So they're, they're really embedded in the middle of this group. They're very interesting for several different reasons. So uh, they, uh, they show sexual reversal. So like that painted snipe that I showed you the picture of. This is the female on the right. The female's uh, uh, more ornamented. The females are larger. Uh, they appear to compete for mates. And the males appear to do most of the parental care. Um, I say appear to because we really don't know from any of the species we just assume, just put from their morphology. They also tend to lay larger clutch sizes. Um, so they've been reported up to five, six eggs in some button quail species. Uh, clutch size is very conserved, usually across uh, Shradriformes. Uh, these are the only group which lay more than four eggs. And they have a very short generation time. So they really seem to be sort of live fast, die young type birds. So considering that they're so sort of interesting and divergent in many traits. Why isn't everyone studying these fascinating birds? And one of the reasons is they are really, really tricky to study in the field. Uh, they are hard to find. They're small. They're skulking. They, they, they like habitats like this, sort of grasslands and woodland savannas. <clears throat> very, very hard to find. They're very uneven densities. And they go missing. They just disappear. So this species was, went missing for about 100 years until it was rediscovered in, in the Philippines. Very, very tricky birds to, to study uh, in, in the wild. <clears throat> but, but there's a species in Madagascar, and it's common. It seems to be common all across the island and all habitats apart from the wettest of the rainforests. Um, and uh, it's high densities. And it is, has particularly strong sex, uh, sexual dimorphism. So this is the female up here, uh, much more highly patterned than the smaller, uh, more cryptic male. So we thought, like, okay, if we're going to learn anything about button quail, this might be the this might be the species to do it in. And what I'm going to show you is is it's pretty much pure natural history. Uh, we're still working on it, still analysing the data as it as it comes in. We're still getting some data in from our uh, local collaborators. Um, so uh, this is very unpolished, but I just wanted to show because it's very interesting. So instead of those wetlands, we moved into those spiny forests and the, uh, and the scrubland. This is what it looks like. These lovely sort of classic baobab trees and octopus trees and scrubland, which is not the easiest habitat to work with, especially if you're as tall as me. Um, the spines on those are sort of can be 10 centimeters long. It's not fun. Um, but we managed to catch lots of individuals in, I think we had about, we're up to about 70 catching days and we've managed to catch over 100 
uh, adults during this time. So we've had great success. Uh, and I'm going to say now we would not have any of the success if it wasn't uh, for our local collaborators and uh, uh, the local population in the villages around who have been very, very helpful in, in uh, helping us to refine the techniques to catch the birds and also to find nests. So yeah, we broke down to about 50 females, 66 males. So it's a male biased population. It appears, at least from our catching data, uh, which might be biased. Um, but this isn't really what we'd expect for a sexual reversed polyandrous system. In those, we would expect there to be uh, far more females than males, and so the females would then have to compete for access to males. Seems to be the other way around. There might be something with the operational sex ratio, though, so it could be that the males are smarter. There may be more males around, they may not be in breeding condition. Something we need to look into a bit more. Just some basic body size stuff. So we have found that females significantly larger than the males. This is um, mass over tarsus. So yeah, generally larger females than males. When we look at the nests, uh, well, the nests are very hard to find. They're very cryptic. I'm going to confess that I have never found a button quail nest. Uh, all of our nests, in fact, have been found by uh, local villagers in the area. So we put the word out. We say, hey, if you can find a if you find a button quail nest, let us know and we'll pay you. And that's been very successful. And in several villages, we've had gangs of children uh, competing against each other to can find the most nests. It's been, it's been great. So that we found, we're, we're higher than this now actually, but 25 nests. Uh, didn't find any more than four eggs in any of these clutches yet, but it could happen, but between two and four eggs. And the nests found uh, at the base of a tree or by a rock or under some, under some fallen branches. And very strange for, for shorebird nests. Some of them are open cut like this, but we have some which are not open cut. So they build a dome over the nest, which is very, very unusual for shorebirds. <clears throat> uh, I've got a video here. I've got a couple of videos actually. So uh, for each nest, we put a, a, a camera so we could um, there we go the male coming in, jumping over the rock. And there is his nest, and he goes in and incubates. So for each of these nests, we put a camera there to see, okay, who's doing the incubation? How long are they incubating for? Do they have, what are their, uh, uh, how long do they spend on the nest? How do they move around? And for all of the nests, this is what we've found. We've found male incubation, and we haven't seen a single female on these nests. It's entirely male, apart from one nest. So this one, hopefully this is going now. And we'll see here, yeah, so we see this bird coming in. You can see it's a, she's a female, she's got the orange, she's got the black, more patterning on the back. This is the nest. And it was really interesting, I couldn't believe it when I saw this, because um, we didn't see this bird in the field. We just saw, we had the nest, we never saw the bird. And there she goes and she incubates. And on this nest, we never saw a male and uh, this is quite interesting for several reasons. First, it shows that females will participate in, in um, uh, parental care at the incubation stage. What's particularly interesting about this, so there are other, these other shorebird species where it's male-only parental care, but females will take over if something happens to the male. Uh, birds like jacanas, this does happen on occasion, but it never happens at the incubation stage. It only ever happens once the chicks have hatched. So it was really, really interesting to see a female take, potentially taking over incubation from a male. This is what I presume had happened. Something happened to the male and the female started taking it over. Obviously, we don't really know. We need to investigate this much, much more. And of course, this was the one nest that we've videoed which got predated. So we don't know what happened to it, what could have happened to it, which uh, was a real shame. Um, but there were other clues that potentially this isn't such a clear-cut case of, of uh, male-only parental care. So when we're out, we're catching the birds. We'd often see them in pairs or small groups. And sometimes we'd catch both birds at the same time. And when we caught them and looked at them, what we thought was a, a female and a male, for instance, this, this bird here we caught, this is a, a juvenile female. So you can see she's developing some black feathers and developing a bit of orange. And so this was caught alongside a female. And we really wouldn't expect this. This is for a territorial species. We really wouldn't expect a female to tolerate another female so close to her. And so 
potentially this is some sort of uh, uh, parental care going on and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the offspring after they've hatched will hang around with the females and potentially the males uh, longer. Uh, still need to investigate this further. We have blood samples from everyone. We're hopefully going to do some paternity and maternity analyses to see, okay, these birds that we catch together like this, are they actually related? Um, but yes, there's some interesting things. And then this is something else which, something I find really intriguing, and I might be completely off here, but I wanted to mention it. So here we have a typical male, typical female. You can see the very different patterning. You also see there's a, a, a difference in the beak morphology. Males generally shorter, stubbier beaks than the females. And we caught a few birds like this. So it looks very male-like, but the beak is long. And she was huge. She was one of the largest, well, I'm saying she, one of the largest birds we caught. Almost certain it's a female. Still need to double check that she is in the lab. But I'm fairly sure she's a female. She does have a little bit of orange patterning here. She wasn't in molt. I don't think this is a sort of non-breeding plumage for females. But why would she look like this and not like this? And I've just got this idea, which I can't quite shake off. Maybe we have a situation here like the fader morph in rough. And so if you don't know what fader males are in rough, so the species here, so we have these very uh, ornamented males, two different male morphs, which compete at these legs. And this is the female. And then you have these female mimic males, which sneak into the population uh, sneak in past these uh, competing males, look like a female, and then they manage to sneak a few mates. So, I don't know. I, I, I don't really know how to go about this. We need to have got a lot more data, need to think about a lot more. But could we have some sort of really cool sort of fader female type thing going on in this system? It would be amazing if that's the case. So, what sort of conclusions can we draw from this? As I say, this is very, very basic work so far. We're still learning a lot. Uh, very tricky to work with, but this Madagascar species really is giving us uh, potential for insight into this family. Definitely sexual reversed, larger females, almost all male incubation, but we do see that this isn't, this isn't a black and white situation and that females will incubate, um, which is particularly interesting, but also that there's some potential post-fledging parental care going on for the females. So, so the future directions that we can go in for this. Um, so if anyone has any money, uh, please let me know. <laughs> um, but uh, I would love to do some sex-specific population genetics, look at uh, the evolution of sex role reversal, but also look at the sort of uh, population demography for males and females. Um, again, I want to look into more post-incubation parental care. Very tricky to do in the wild. These, these little, little snack-sized babies are very hard to track. I'd love to find out more about these. And also just do some basic sorting out of the sort of the family itself. Go into some museums, get some DNA, sort of look at the sort of uh, phylogeny of these, of these birds because we really don't know a lot about the very basic stuff. So... With that, I just want to start with the button quail team. So uh, uh, Niela and Nado uh, uh, in the local community who spent so much time teaching us and how to catch button quail, very patient. Um, uh, and the people of the, 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 the area in Andavadok and Ampasilav and the villages around who have been so generous uh, with helping us. And, uh, and the scientific team, so uh, Tafita here and uh, obviously Sama and, and Tamas as well. And then also uh, more thanks for all the uh, people from the plover side, especially uh, this has been work with obviously me in, in Debrecen and Thomas, but in Bath and particularly in Bielefeld in Germany and, and other parts of the world. It's a very big collaboration. Uh, and Thomas in the center, Sama here, and uh, the funding agencies. So a lot of this has been funded uh, by not only the DFG grants in Germany, but also uh, the Elven Isle project and the Hungarian agencies that have funded us. And so with that, I would like to say thank you very much to everyone for listening. Thank you for having me in the department these last two and a half years. And uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Sorry, it was a lot. Yeah. <laughs>
So with these bottom players, is there a full maturation going on? So like first year <coughs> birds are different from older birds? Yeah, so it's it's much more rapid than that. Um, let me go back and show you that one. So I don't know how old this bird is, but uh, there was a study done on one of the Asian species which they had in the lab, and so they could look at their maturation times. It's incredibly rapid. They, um, <clears throat> I think it's the same for the Madagascar species. Uh, they hatch 12 days after the eggs are laid, which is almost unheard of, especially in non-passerines. And then it takes them about a month to go from hatchling stage to adult size and adult stipe feathers. I would, I would not be surprised if this bird was maybe five weeks old. Um, so I think they go straight into their breeding colors and they can breed after maybe three, four months. Very, very rapid. This is like zebra finch levels of, of breeding, yeah. Um, and what we, we found is that they seem to breed throughout the year. So uh, uh, yeah, there doesn't seem to be any, any non-breeding season. They just breed and breed and breed. Um, in theory, yes, I would love to be able to, again, if anyone has any money to set up a breeding facility, um, I, would, I would love to bring them. And it can be done, as I said, one of the Asian species has been kept in the past. I think there is a zoo, at least one zoo has had Madagas the Madagascar species. But I don't know of any in captivity now, but um, it, it can be done. It would be yeah, fascinating system in lab and the field. Yeah. When it comes to nest hunting, I think it's a very <laughs> underrated method is using dogs because uh, you know you can you can use kits from the villages. But mm. They're expensive because you need to pay them, and dogs are cheaper and maybe more efficient than kids. Yeah, maybe, but then you have to train the dog, and yeah, there you are just need to train once. There are the thing in Madagascar. There there are feral dogs, but there aren't really any. We find <laughs> acquiring a dog in Madagascar would be would be harder. I think. But the thing about the button quail is they, so they're, they're hunted quite a lot, although not in the coastal communities. They're, they're, it's taboo to hunt, to hunt and eat them in these coastal communities, but in the rest of Madagascar, they're hunted a lot. So uh, people are very good at finding them and tracking them. But despite that, they, we find very high densities around villages and very close to humans. So um, you don't have to go far, far out of a village to sort of find them. Uh, so that was another thing which makes them quite interesting, quite uh, easy to study in that respect. Um, yeah, they have, uh, especially catching birds, uh, a lot of villagers have uh, pens for their zebu, so they bring them in and keep them. And there's a lot of zebu dung around, and the button quail will come to the villages and peck around the zebu dung, getting the insects. So and these zebu pens is a very fruitful catching spot for them. Yeah. But yes, ideal world dogs and uh and things like that could could work as well Yeah, I think so. I, we don't know anything about the, the adult survival yet in the wild for any of these species because because of uh, because they're so tricky. There was a one of these lab populations. They did look at it, and it was uh, they showed that uh, uh, females uh, had uh, significantly lower survival than males. They were like a few years, I think, like four years, I think, was getting old for them. So. Um, if that's what it's like in captivity, I would imagine in, in the wild it's a lot uh, a lot shorter. They are not very good at flying, they're running around on the ground. I think they're perfect food for anything that likes to eat a bird. Um, snakes, uh, 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 falcons, uh, raptors, all sorts get them. Uh, the, we've seen lizards trying to catch the, uh, the chicks as well, so they're yeah, they're food for everyone. So probably one of the reasons why they're so sort of, okay, <laughs> it's, I'm three months old, I really need to get on and breed, otherwise I'm not gonna make it to four months. Yeah. How many times they breed in a year? I don't know. I would not be surprised if they just keep going and going and going. 
um, there must be some sort of latency period, um, especially for the males. Um, but the females, I suspect, will just find males and dump eggs in nests and just keep on dumping. And then um, potentially when they hatch and if they've made it to the hatching stage in their territory, then they'll sort of keep track of what's going on and make sure everything's okay. But there must be some sort of latency period, but I don't know yet. I mean, this would be, yeah, one of the things we want to do is a bit of tracking maybe in the future, but, um, but also something we could potentially look at in the lab. I think probably higher than four for these. Yeah, we didn't find anything more than four, but other species are known to lay five, six, seven eggs. So could we have higher? Um, I would be shocked if they were only one, once a year breeders. Um, I, I really think it would be every few months. You mentioned that there were this like, sneaky, maybe sneaky female. <laughs> yeah. But like, those are like, there were like six, 66 males and 50 females that you got. So it was like a male. So you know also the number of the sneaky females. No, it was, it was uh, uh, off the top of my head, it was like, I think, two or three birds like that. I don't know. I need to, I still need to double check. We're still doing the sexing right now, just to double check that everyone is who we think they are. Um, but yes, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I just can't shake off the idea because I think it'd be really cool if there was a, in a, a sneaker female in the sex role reverse species. I think that would just be very exciting. Well, we have the blood, we're just doing the lab stuff now, so. But you don't have the... Not yet, no, no, but I am just more, uh, all, all the other morphological, I am, I'm 95% certain. Oh, uh, absolutely, it could, yeah, we could find out, uh, yeah. Um, but I, I, yeah, it was, it was just female, just everything, everything apart from the, the coloration was female, yeah. There are other small differences, which are harder to see in the photos, but they have iris, slight differences in the iris color. Uh, the females are, are, are more bluish and the, the, the males more um, yellowish, uh, sort of cream colored. So there was, as I said, everything apart from the feathers. <laughs> it, was, it was screaming female, yeah. So what is your explanation for the, the aberrant bias in the sex ratio? Do you think it's... it's for, for the what, sorry? For the aberrant bias in the sex ratio, Male bias. Do you think it's uh, trackably the difference in, in uh, yeah? That's gender. one major thing that it could be. Um, or is it, it the real genuine? It bias? could be a genuine bias. So it could be that the females are sort of fighting more. They could be injured more. They could be more obvious. So they could be being predated more. Um, from that perspective, there could be. I think there could be a catching bias. I think that. Uh, we might find that some birds which we thought were males might turn out to be juvenile females, which hadn't developed any of these colours yet. So that's, we still need to change that. So it could become a bit more 50-50 after we have that uh, sexing data come in. But uh, yeah, I think, I think that could be a mixture of catching bias and potentially mis-ID. So it's more males than females? Mm, which isn't what you would expect. Yeah, but if you have more males, if you have fewer females, then you'd expect more males, then the males would have to compete for access to those females. So you'd expect the sort of polyandry to occur, maybe if there were excess females. Um, but obviously what might have happened in their evolution history might be very different to what was happening when we were catching. Yeah, um, you just set up a net and then set up a the territory of the female and then several males, then you would catch more males. Yeah. Yeah, so we, would, we wouldn't be, virtually none of the birds we caught were misnetted, so we were walking around the forest, we'd spot them, and we would use a local snare trap method. So we'd see the bird and set up the snare trap and, and chase it into the trap and catch it that way. So, um, so even just walking around, you would, you would see a lot more males than you would females as well. So, um, and also, the other thing is, if the males are then sitting on nests more frequently, so you maybe not you'd be seeing them as much. So there could even be even more males in the population we see. So 
yeah, lots of different reasons why. Not really there yet. It's all, everything's very half-baked right now. We, <laughs> and, and going back to the full baked uh, part of the, the story, the Black Waters, yeah. I found it actually very interesting that you find higher survival uh, in larger crunches. Yeah. Because... Yeah, so a few theories we have here. Um, so one is that those larger clutches would require more um, uh, uh, defense potentially. So you've you invested more. This? No, this is a this is an idea. This is just a theory. So um, uh, that they would be defended a bit more strongly. Um, it's also possible we we do see occasionally partial predation. Uh, so one of the main nest predators are pied crows, um, which kind of look like our hooded crows here, but they're black and white instead of grey and white. Um, occasionally we do see where we've caught it on camera, a crow has come in, it's eaten an egg, flown off with it, and then a few days later it comes back and gets one. The next one, sometimes they don't come back. It, this is, doesn't happen very often. So it could be that these are already partially predated nests and the predator is just going to come back and get them. This might explain a little bit of it. I, it doesn't explain it entirely because we do have some genuinely, genuinely one egg nests in Kitlises. So not, it isn't all due to partial predation. Uh, I think that's, I think, yeah, those could be two explanations for it. Also, it could be that, again, that, um, well, there wasn't really much of a temporal trend. So I don't think it's that, those higher egg clutches are more because also then the conditions are better so the parents think okay we're more, these eggs are more likely to hatch because everything's much better so i don't think it's necessarily that but we we haven't got a really good explanation um, do i get this right that the the, the major part of the, the hatching theory is must be nest predation right yeah uh so i didn't like, uh, send that. Like that no no failure to hatch is fairly rare um, it's almost all predation, um, occasionally from other things as well. Sometimes like the zebu trample a nest, things like that. So, um, occasionally, occasionally they desert, but it's, uh, but just failure to hatch is, yeah. And actually when we include these, so an egg which lasts until it should have hatched, we've sort of, even though they haven't hatched, the nest has survived that long. So they would be included in the survived data, even though they never hatched. So, but there are very few examples of that anyway. But I feel like if you think about it, if, you, if a female feels like it's a safer food nest, then she will invest more and then she will have a higher number of eggs. Also, if they synchronize with the species that the nesting is synchronized, yeah. at that time, they might invest more and they you might have higher nests. Exactly. I think this this kind of feeds into it a little bit. I think though that we didn't really see much of a temporal trend. So the nests that are there in the bad years, there are fewer of them lower densities. I don't think it's a it can be a density thing or, or the condition generally conditions which which account for it. But um, yeah. Yeah, we don't really know. <laughs> so, thank you, Will, for your really interesting presentation. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thank you all for coming. And thank you for listening. Okay. So yeah. let's give it a minute. Yeah, Merry Christmas and you have Yeah.